Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our, uh, you know, our first joint committee between alternatives to the policing and the spending and some tracks uh, subcommittees. Uh, we are calling to order. This Zoom recording is being, the, this Zoom call is being recorded. Uh, Noah, if you want to just run roll call real quick, and then uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Yeah. Booker? Here. Javier? Here. Alex? Here. Dan? Here. Michael? Here. Josie? Here. And Carol? Jeff? Arrived. Ah, she's just checking in. Okay. And um, Nick is also here too. Oh, and Nick. Thank you. Awesome. So, uh, first thing on the agenda is the approval of meeting minutes. Uh, I'm guessing these are for our subcommittees, uh, Noah. Mm hmm Yeah. You only had to read the ones that are relevant to you. <laughs> okay. Does someone want to motion? I, I always forget. Is it us, the chairs, who motion for the approval of minutes or someone else has to do it? Josie, can I ask that um, let's first do your committee because I haven't looked at your committee's min minutes. Sure. Um, yeah. Move we, to approve spending and contracts minutes. Second. Yeah. Uh, I got nothing to say. So, no, you want to vote us off? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dan. Yes. Josie. Yes. Michael. Yes. Well, thank you. I would like to entertain um, those who have been able to review the minutes from the alternatives committee. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Move uh, approval. Second. We have a motion for approval and second. Um, uh, Noah, would you please count us off? Yes. Booker. Yes. Javier. Yes. Alex? Yes. Uh, Carol? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> awesome. So with that first agenda item uh, nicely cleaned up, we're going to move over to the public comment portion of tonight's meeting. It will run 15 minutes. Uh, I believe it's three minutes per person. Is that correct? Okay. And um, do we want to start? Do we want to just give people an extra two minutes? So that's like a nice even uh, 55, or are we good with starting just right now? Uh, Booker, what do you think? I think we should start now. I will be glad to time people for three minutes once they begin. Sure. All right, so we're going to open the floor. Uh, if you want to speak during tonight's open minutes, make sure that you use the raise hand feature. If you do not have that feature on your Zoom, feel free to um, message one of us here, either Noah, um, Booker, or myself, and we'll try to keep track of uh, where your place in the, the line is in terms of raised hands. Um, but we will start now with the phone number ending in 5171. Uh, I'm going to ask you to un unmute if I have that ability. Does not look like I do. Okay. But you can Hi, this is... You can talk. It's Jane Doe again. I am following up on last night. I listened to the meeting. I just, um, I'm concerned because you have two weeks left to produce the report and you still don't have a sample of resident responses. You only posted a consent form today on the city's website. It's really late in the game. As of yesterday, there was no link to the form. You still didn't have submissions because this commission started months and months and months ago and so many of you have advanced degrees i just really wonder how you didn't design something where you could capture testimony from victims of crime and even people just generally in the community a lot longer ago you didn't research our experiences those of us with domestic violence issues and history You've had many months to do this. Alex talked about you, you not even being in a position to make domestic violence recommendations. That's unacceptable. That is a failure for victims of all races and victims of all crimes. You talked yesterday about how you needed respect on Saturday for public comment. But if you're uncomfortable hearing about the ways that you're failing, you don't need to be on the commission. We as victims need to be heard and taken seriously. And our experiences 
positively with the Northampton Police Department need to be included. But you, in every single way that I've looked to try to do that, it's been difficult. And it's very difficult for people that are in shelters and on the streets and who don't have technology to do so. I'm really worried about it. Policing has to do with crime, which has to do with victims who you don't understand because you haven't structured research to capture our experiences. And a lot of you, I just, I really don't understand it. It's, um, it's so critical and why I'm the one as a victim that has to tell you this so late is beyond me. The only person who really continues to speak about safety for all of us is Namdi. This commissioner again and again thinks of those who've been victimized, who are victims of violent crime and have had positive experiences with the department and those who may have not. And he asks you again and again in meetings to imagine the Northampton Police Department serving us both. He cautions you again and again about the critical importance of our police as they are. For what you term rare events, I am not a rare event. I'm a person who continues to need protection every single day from our officers, not social workers, every single day. Because when my batterer violates the restraining order for the third time and there are no officers to respond, the blood is going to be on your hands. And you should write that down, and I will talk about it. I will talk about it at the city council. I will talk about it in the media. You need to understand how serious this so is. Your three it minutes are up. Do you want to complete your statement? You need to listen to victims. You are on a policing commission. Listen. This is a deadly, serious issue. Please listen to us. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now be moving on to the next person with their hand raised. Uh, if uh, pick, uh, I'm going to ask you to, um, to, un to unmute, and here you go. Excuse me. OK, hello. Can you hear me? I, yep. Yeah, I can. So I'm trying to figure out, I'm on, I'm on a phone. I don't know how to raise my hand on the phone, but I wanted to speak. I didn't know if there was a time that I could speak. I don't have access to the internet right now. Sure, sure, sure. So we're, we're going to slip you into the line. Sorry about that, uh, Pip. Um, uh, uh, Josie, why don't we let him speak since he's already connected? Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, my name is, uh, I, I prefer to leave my name out of this. Um, however, though, you know, one of the things is, is that, you know, I, I have um, lots of experience right now currently within, uh, with, within the uh, Northampton community, and, and I've seen their policing work. I've seen that they've done uh, fantastic jobs. Um, another woman was speaking about possibly, uh, sorry, I just hopped on to the last bit of your conversation. Um, it's from what my knowledge is, is that actually there's a resource officer that's, uh, that works with Northampton Police Department. Again, I'm not uh, any bit involved with Northampton Police Department. I'm not a police officer. I'm a citizen. Um, Northampton Police Department recently, I believe, uh, an officer privately with his own money purchased a, uh, purchased a uh, <clears throat> comfort dog that uh, is used and uh, facilitated on a frequent basis within Northampton schools. Um, he also is a uh, school resource officer. Uh, a very large thing that's a very big concern of mine that I would also like to put into perspective is, is uh, I believe it was last weekend that there was a bank robbery in place. You know, the, one of the large concerns of mine is by defunding the uh, police department and by defunding uh, uh, um, and restricting their access to certain trainings um, that are crucial uh, with nowadays, uh, there's lots of um, uh, issues that, that happen that we say it was police violence. And what the big thing is, is that if we defund our police departments right now, what I'm worried about is seeing an increase in the quote-unquote violence um, 
occurring? Why don't we fund our police departments and, and, and put them through additional training so that they can be properly educated on how to deal with mental people that are in mental distress or anything like that? A uh, while back ago in seventh grade, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 24 years old. A while back ago in seventh grade, I actually did a research paper about police shootings, and a lot of them were what were called suicide by cops. Um, and a lot of people um, nowadays are going through a lot of mental distress, um, and they act out because they could necessarily be on, they, they may be on narcotics, they may be uh, depressed, they may not know how to else get to get attention. Um, the Northampton Police Department on numerous occasions, I've witnessed them deal with very difficult situations, um, and they've done it with excellence, um, with compassion. So, um, sir, thank you for your comments. You've actually only have three minutes to comment. Would you like to complete your comment? Uh, what am I at right now, sir? You're at your past three minutes. Okay. My sincere apologies. Uh, I will uh, conclude my comment. Thank you very much for letting me share. And thank you very much for giving us your voice. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so we're going to try again with you, uh, Pip. I'm going to unmute you, and you have three minutes. Oh, hello. Thank you. So during the whole time of the commission's uh, activity, I, I've been looking forward to the publication in the, of the research, documentation, and data um, with regard to the Northampton Police Department and their systemic abuse of minorities. And I've, I've wanted to uh, involve you on the commission with this project because it, I haven't seen it. Now I've been able to, on my own, uh, find two cases that one with Andrew Cole and uh, an officer uh, with the department and one with a gentleman named Eric Matlock. Um, these cases are uh, several years old. And um, those are the two, which isn't really suggesting a, a systemic racial abuse by officers. And it doesn't suggest also a very violent um, and inappropriate behavior by office in the Northampton Police Department. And I understand that in Chicago and New York and Boston, even in Springfield and, you know, in New Orleans. I mean, there's problems in police departments throughout the country and we've seen that all summer. But I want to know what's going on with the problems that we have in the Northampton Police Department. That is, very much your job. And I don't see this evidence being produced by this commission. And I'm, I've been waiting for it all summer. So you can, we, we certainly, and the conversation nationally is about these other departments. But I think in Northampton, we have a very clear oversight of police behavior. And I know that it's been seven months with the commissions uh, looking at the behavior of Northampton Police Department. It's been seven months. You can file a Freedom of Information Act. You can get internal documents from the department about these abuses if they do indeed exist. And then you can address them. And that's really important. And I'll just, I'll just reiterate what I heard on WHMP, uh, uh, Councilor, um, Quinlan say that in the history of the department, since they've been taking this kind of information, they don't have a documented case of a officer discharging their firearm, which I found extraordinary. But it makes sense because we're well governed in this town. And that's why a lot of us live here. It's also safe. And that's because there's excellent civilian oversight of the Northampton Police Department. So your three so, minutes are up. Do you want to complete your comment, please? It, it's, yes, it's just not clear to me what this commission is trying to address in with regard to the Northampton Police Department. 
thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and it looks like out of uh, the hands that are raised, there is only one more left. Um, and I also believe we only have about three more minutes left for public comments. So uh, Ed Olmsted, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you have three minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all the hard work you're doing. Um, I wanted to just speak tonight because uh, I was looking at, this is the spending and alternatives uh, uh, joint committee. And um, I am just hoping that there isn't a, um, pressure, that one doesn't feel too much pressure to come up with a prediction of what it's going to cost to uh, fund alternatives to the police department. Um, I think that there's two reasons uh, I'm concerned about that. One is that I think that the uh, alternatives that are available through social services and other uh, nonprofit agencies should be looked at as far as their compensation packages, their employment benefits, and that um, it's hard to predict that because over the years I worked in uh, doing mental health outreach, uh, primarily in Holyoke Springfield for many years. Uh, my, you know, my experience is has been less and less money. The salaries and wages have probably remained stagnant and the uh, compensation compared to police and so job security is a lot less. And I think it's hard to, if we mo model over uh, any future we model future uh, costs based on the present, uh, there's a system that is not uh, fair as it should be. I would, um, if there are costs that can be predicted such as providing bathrooms, uh, pot potable water, et cetera, uh, it makes sense to predict those costs. But I am uh, concerned about predicting costs when, um, I think that the, the alternatives many times are underfunded these days. And I also think that we've done a great job of um, assessing the needs and hearing input from people. Um, but I think that there's still some reluctance to uh, admit the longevity of the problems and the, the complexity of the problems that people face um, either with mental illnesses or homelessness or financial problems and that uh, this, over time uh, that services have narrowed so much that some people just don't get to be served by, um, by uh, social service agencies. So I'm just hoping that there isn't the pressure to come up with a, a total budget um, to, to predict the total budget, the total cost of services in the future, both for those who might be served and for those who might be employed in serving those people. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much for your uh, testimony. Awesome. Uh, so it looks like, uh, so we uh, we did start a little bit late, so we are going to allow for these this final hand uh, to speak openly, and then we are going to move on to the next agenda items. So uh, Yaping, I'm going to unmute you and you're going to have uh, three uh, minutes. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, I'm just going to read a testimonial that was submitted to the Wildflower Alliance in response to their survey um, about police experiences. Um, in mid-January 2018, the police were called by employees of Edward Jones at six, at six Market Street to deal with a homeless man who was sitting on the front steps of their walk. He was minding his own business and causing um, no distraction or harm. He was visibly drunk. The police arrived and they began to drag him down the street with his bare back on the ground, his shirt and jacket being lifted up to expose his skin to the raw ice and cement. His pants were also falling down in the chaos. It is not clear if the man was in need of medical assistance prior to being dragged down the sidewalk, but soon an ambulance showed up with a stretcher and loaded him inside. The policeman could have very easily waited for the stretcher and lifted him onto it as the paramedics and EMTs eventually did. But by the time they arrived, the police had already injured him by dragging him down the street. I believe I have some of this on camera, though not the entire incident 
My boss and I were there yelling at them to stop and leave him alone and I began recording. I filed a police report and the officers were very mocking and callous to the incident. I heard them mutter about my testimony as I was walking out the door but had not let, left yet. Unfortunately, I do not remember their exact words. Not long after, I received a letter that it was found that no excessive force had been used, the police had acted appropriately and my complaint had been closed. Um, if there's a little more time, I'll read one more. Um, uh, we might've read this before, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, this is from someone else. I was dissociating, knowing the police were coming. I grabbed a knife in two occasions and flopped face down onto my bed. The police smashed down my door, took most of my hobby supplies and aimed their guns at me and shouted. I went into a freeze response, holding the knife to myself. Another officer joined the three or four after a minute or two. He said, I'm sick of her shit and dealing with her and her knife. They pried away the knife with a baton and charged me with assault with a deadly weapon. My lawyer made me take a plea deal as he said the cops lie under oath. The second incident, the officers talked gently and got me to lower the knife. I've since met with a representative from the police about such incidents. And then another person, um, testimony was, I was not living in reality. The police had no I little idea what was going on. They said I was just an insane little girl. Even I was 18 years old at the time. They did not offer me any support whatsoever. Um, if there's more, I'll just go into it. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. So with that, we will be closing uh, public comment and we will be moving on to the next agenda item, which is um, the discussion of recommendations and exploring funding and contractual obligations, obligations and challenges. Um, so if anyone wants to start, uh, one I want to say though, what a fantastic opportunity it is for our two subcommittees to get together and finally kind of put some muscle to the bones of this operation. Um, so yeah, I, I feel incredibly privileged to be here with all of you. So I think I'm gonna chair this part of this discussion. Um, would it be helpful to, for the um, our partner committee to hear what kinds of alternative recommendations that the alternatives committee is going to be recommending would that be a good place to start yeah absolutely uh as we've kind of alluded to before through the very nature of being the spending and contracts committee we are very reactionary so uh, we have discussed various revenue like uh various uh methods in terms of funding um but it really comes down to what uh the commission is actually recommending at the end of the day so yeah absolutely so i'm gonna I'm gonna ask Carol, then Alex, then Javier to speak about recommendations we're gonna be making. Um, is it okay if I time each of you to like two to three minutes? Would that be okay with all of you as a president? And if you use less time, that's fine. Okay. I'm, I'm sort of looking at your hands trying to decide, is that okay? Alex, is that okay? Or do you have a rec different recommendation? It's okay. <laughs> um, do you want me to read the basic outline that describes the two phases? Um, yes, I would ask you to do that too. During my time or now? Um, I was gonna ask Carol to go first, but okay. um, I'd I like Carol to go first, if that's okay. Okay. So go ahead. Yeah, all right. So what we seem to be coalescing around to bring to the whole commission is an endorsement of the development of an alternative to policing mental health crisis response model for Northampton that would be modeled after the CAHOOTS model in Eugene, but would be unique and you know locally relevant <clears throat> to Northampton. Um, one of the things that's kind of impressive about CAHOOTS is the integrative health model, which includes, um, because they, they um, conceptualize into their, into their responses, uh, mental health needs, 
active addictions, <clears throat> homeless status, impacts of chronic poverty on people, and whether the person to whom they're responding is being threatened by another individual. And the integrative model includes attention to their healthcare needs, as well as their immediate, uh, what might be a mental health crisis or housing crisis. Um, <clears throat> as, as most of you probably know, the, uh, the CAHOOTS model, there's a number of models, I won't go into those because that'll be in the report in the, in the appendix in detail, but the CAHOOTS model has been in place for 32 years. Uh, what they've come up with is that they handle their dispatch through a public safety team rather than the, I think they were originally embedded under Eugene Police Department, but they, now the city has developed a full on public safety team that has many elements to it. Um, they have reported that in the 32 years of operation, there have been no injuries of CAHOOTS workers who go out in the vans. It's usually their staffing is um, um, <clears throat> a, a person with a lived experience partnered with, uh, sometimes they send out um, clinical, you know, mental health um, crisis workers who are trained. The, the mental health consumer survivors are also trained. Everybody uses non-coercive interventions. It's kind of person to person, you know, asking the person to whom they're for uh, they're calling on for ideas about what would be needed right about now. So it's a very strengths-based person to person, per, um, you know, um, person-centered approach. They do a backup from the police. They report that <clears throat> they did a study in, in 2019 of the 18,000 calls that they responded to and only 311 were re uh, requiring backup by the police. Um, so I think I may stop right there. I mean, clearly, if we recommend this, we're going to have to con consider existing crisis contracts in town, CSO, ServiceNet, et cetera. Um, we may also, I don't think we've clarified this yet as a subcommittee, but the um, models, the peer-led peer respite program that exists in, in Northampton, the AFIA program and, and, and programs like that, um, I think uh, probably need to be amplified and, and further funded, but managed by um, peer-led management, basically. So I think I'll stop now. And um, Alex, do you wanna add something? You add hey, your- Carol, yeah. Alex, why don't you speak? And then we can, if you have questions about any of these things we're discussing, we can come back to that after you hear sort of brief blurbs about each issue. Alex, please. Sure, thank you, Carol. Um, so we've been uh, trying to identify the different areas that where we feel uh, we have gathered enough testimony and information to confidently recommend moving forward on a particular path. And we, we call those our, our phase one. Um, and then phase two is our areas where um, we felt that more study is needed to understand how to move forward here in Northampton. And so in phase one, um, the mental health crisis response that Carol talked about, um, the resilience hub, which is, is moving forward uh, already, um, uh, housing first approach uh, and um, an approach to substance use. And, and those two would be uh, connected in the crisis response in that um, you know, people who would be able to think uh, about um, people's needs, whether they're substance users or homeless uh, as well. Um, so that's phase one. And then in phase two, um, we have um, the issue of, of civilian flaggers um, rather than the police where that's allowed by state law. Um, we have uh, restorative and transformative justice programs, um, uh, the, um, domestic violence mm -hmm. and sexual assault, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, and then issues about traffic, wellness checks, noise and nuisance complaints, uh, on an unarmed civilian investigator for insurance claims, um, number of, of issues where uh, it's, we've determined uh, that you know, an armed response is not 
uh, <clears throat> uh, necessary in those cases and how could we create the, the opportunities for that. Um, <clears throat> so the, those, that's our current framework. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, I, I think we have a strong program in the Northampton Police Department um, for, for these issues um, with partnerships with Safe Passage and uh, the, uh, is it the, still called the Every Woman Center? It might be called something different. No, now, but, um, it's the Center for Women and Communities. Center for Women and Communities, right? As well as civilian advocates um, that are um, housed in, in the police department. Um, so that approach uh, is there, there's important um, resources and um, ways in which, you know, preventing immediate prevention of, of uh, imminent violence um, can happen um, in that approach. <clears throat> and what we would like to continue to study is um, the concern that, uh, well, that, that there are, we, there is testimony that um, the that the approach, the police approach, um, has not always been <clears throat> well received. Um, but also that as much as fifty percent of people um, who are subjected to violence don't report that violence because of the fear of the consequences to their lives, uh, whether that's um, <clears throat> in terms of their children being taken away or a loss of employment either by them or their partner. Um, and so looking at how there are many other, um, there are ways in which uh, people who are subjected to violence can, we, they need other options to be able to engage um, <clears throat> to, uh, and to have that be their choice as far as how much of the criminal system that they engage in. Um, <clears throat> and to, um, and we'll, in the, most of this will be in an appendix um, that talks about uh, economic approach, economic support, and how much that can assist um, violent support to reduce violence um, using a public health approach and um, a uh, looking um, at a, a different different methods of intervention that may um, result ultimately in less violence. Um, so, but that that, that program um, feel would be wise to continue to do further study before we are not ready to implement any specific recommendations there. Thank you, Alex. Javier. Yeah. Um, so, in relationship to to a similar uh, program as Kahoot, there are a couple of things, right? So up to 75% of people working for Kahoot uh, describe themselves as people who has experienced uh, one of the either mental, drug-related, or any other of those uh, issues, right? Which is something, at least uh, for me, it's extremely important if we're, if we're going to be talking about the Kahoot's model. Also, it's worth to point out that the Kahoot model didn't start it as a service provider was a uh, grassroots um, endeavor at the beginning, and they, they, they started like that. So it, Cahoots never started an, an association with any kind of sort of formal service provider. Um, also, one of the things that I personally have been talking with the subcommittee is the relationship of how um, we create uh, accountability loop with people who are being served who can actually come forward without having uh being fearful of losing the service to be able to speak up and to state that either is either it's a good service in the best case scenario mm -hmm. or it's not a good service as it, it, sometimes we have heard how the humanizing can be so i think that's extremely important in any kind of model that we're gonna be proposing um, also, it's, it's sort of complicated, it has been complicated for the alternative subcommittee to get organizations being able to talk to us, either they are not getting back to us, or they got organizations who uh, their, their uh, funding depends on grants related, uh, attached to the police department, all the, uh, the office of the district attorney. 
So even though there, there may be organizations that would like to see a different approach to what they do, um, they will not testify because of they don't want to jeopardize their own uh, livelihood, right? So having all that in mind, um, hopefully if, if, if we are talking about the Kahoot model, we're going to move <laughs> with something that, it's, that is similar, not only in, 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 a, in a big picture sense, but also in the fact that uh, the people who work at Kahoot, it's uh, describing themselves as people who has experienced those problems. Thank you, Javier. So let's um, begin a discussion. Um, uh, are there any questions about any of these issues that have been brought up? Dan. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I guess I'll ask, I mean, this is the, the question I think I've asked a lot. So <laughs> um, I think the, um, one of the things that we're, one of the things that's sort of been discussed, uh, or at least for us, is sort of like, well, what, what are the, I'm trying to think of how to say this the right way. What do we need to do? Um, to fund um, to fund those services, <laughs> like, like what's the structure for some of those recommendations? And I think this might be something we haven't decided yet, but just thinking about like, what are the structures? One of the things that concerns us a lot, and we've heard you know, testimony from a number of pe different people from organizations, um, especially those that are grant funded, which is that, you know, if things are funded by grants and, you know, uh, the grants dry up, <laughs> so do those programs um, and grants, can dry up very quickly. And so thinking about how these are structured, um, mm -hmm. you know, are, if we're looking at a CAHOOTS model, are these city employees or are we partnering with another organization? If we're partnering with another organization, um, also thinking about like accountability um, and, and things like that are gonna be important. Um, so what does, <laughs> you know, sort of like, what does that structure look like? What, what is like, and again, this might be something we define a little bit more, you know, soon, but like, what, what does a CAHOOTS model look like for us? Mm -hmm. I guess is the question. But sure. my understanding is initially <clears throat> the um, founders, the organizers who were you know, self-described as old countercultural folks from the 60s and 70s <clears throat> um, were working with the police department and were um, really a part of the, the, initi the initiation was, I think they were taken on in the budget of the uh, police department. I really, I don't know how many years that <clears throat> structure continued, but at some point it sounds like there were political processes that resulted in the development of a whole new, um, broad, more broad-based public safety bureaucracy. And I think my understanding is at this point, and again, I don't know when it happened, but they have a separate dispatch. So they're not going through the standard 911 dispatch. However, whoever does the central dispatch sometimes will ask, so does this sound like something that CAHOOTS could, could handle. And um, CAHOOTS is very well known in that city. And so sometimes there is a preference, whoever's calling, it may be an observer of someone who's in trouble, you know, who's in distress will say, oh yes, and CAHOOTS. So I'm not clear on the, you know, all of the, the fine points and that's something we really should look into because they have so much experience there, you know, bureaucratically um, that there, it, it might be useful to check in with them. I bet, you know, how did, how did they fund it initially? How did they trans, you know, how did they transition it over? And I do hear your point about grant. There will be grants that we could apply for here at the state level. I don't know what the pot of money will be at the state level, but there is potentially going to be a, an opportunity to do this kind of transition 
uh, as an applicant in Northampton, and there will undoubtedly be some federal money. But I think your point is well taken. You don't want to run a whole new program just on grants. Yeah, and I think <laughs> one of the things that, that gives me a little bit of hope is that, you know, we have this, it's been floated that we have, you know, a, or that we might have a recommendation, I would push that we do uh, for a new department to house a lot of these initiatives, in which case that gives us that sort of structure, which is good. Um, I think there are, um, so there are new sort of um, funding opportunities um, through, well, there might be <laughs> through like um, uh, Lindsay Sabados's uh, right. bill, you know, that has, you know, all sorts of grants for these sort of, just these sort of initiatives. But um, I, I guess the question would be pie, pie in the sky, no limits. Um, what, where would you see like the CAHOOTS program living first? I mean, would you see that as something in the police department or something 100% outside of it? Um, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry, Carol. So, yeah, the, yeah, Javier, so Javier has his hand up and I'm going to let mm -hmm. him, we, we can circle back. Mm -hmm. Javier? <clears throat> thanks, Booker. Um, so two things. The first one is, I mean, I, I hope that, I mean, if, so the, the, the relevancy and importance of, of, of what we're talking about, I think it goes hand to hand with something that it's, you know, we have said this about systemic change, right? Because we have been talking about systemic change, this has to go attached to no independent grants, no independent nonprofit. This has to be attached to, to the city. That's that's my my take into this, right? I mean, I would never think about trying to do the change that we're looking to do um, through the creation of another nonprofit in the you know in the ocean of nonprofits in Western Mass, right? That's one thing. And the other, uh, even though the piece of legislation that uh, Representative Sabatosa and I think Senator Chang Diaz uh, are moving forward we should not count with that it's extremely it's it's so as far as i know this session so massachusetts has a two-year uh, legislative session and this session only uh where has been introduced six thousand five hundred pieces of legislation it's really uh unusual that uh first time piece of legislation that is introduced uh passes Many times takes a while, a fair amount, a fair amount of years. And even in the best case scenario, if that piece of legislation uh, is enacted, there is going to be a long process of working, uh, working the process and working how that's going to be deployed. And, and that's going to ask for the creation of different, different things within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So... <laughs> I, I would say that we we should just work with what we have. I and I would have loved that this commission was created after that bill passed, and all of a sudden we're talking about having this this sort of baseline. No, it's not the case. Um, so and anyway, that's the, the things that I want to say. Thank you, Javier. I, I I have to ask if Michael or Alex can speak to this issue of sort of. Um, because my understanding is this is really complicated because these things are partially funded by the state, partially funded by the city, partially funded by the Fed. Um, some are grants, some are other kinds of contracts. Um, and it's sort of a maze. And I, I, I'll just say openly, I have not gotten into the, these weeds. Um, and so I don't know how to think about it. And so I guess I'm asking if Alex or Michael have thoughts about this from their work in, with the city. Michael, it looks like you're unmuted, so please. Yeah, I mean, my, um, and Alex, you can definitely please chime in and correct me if, I, if I'm incorrect at all, but kind of my uh, observations of, of Mayor Narkowitz and the way he kind of goes about it is that a lot of times with, with grant work um, or what he would call um, 
you know, um, like before when we, when he's just stopped collecting the 3% community mitigation money for adult use marijuana, but he wouldn't budget that into something that's like been a, an extra sort of thing. And he, uh, he doesn't budget based on grants, I don't think. Um, you know, in, in the case of, for instance, the D.A.R.E. officer, which was, I mean, that's a program that ended quite a few years ago, but that was grant funded position. And then the grant, uh, you know, the program was was taken away in Northampton, uh, then um, it's, it, Northampton continued with that program after that. Uh, so, you know, I think we had to then add it into the budget, uh, but that's not been Mayor Narkowitz's general thing is to, to do something um, that's grant-based as part of the full budget. He, he usually, he likes a, you know, stable financing. Um, Alex, I can, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I can add, uh, you know, the a lot of the contracts with the social service agencies uh, are with, are actually with the state. Um, and so this is something I talked about before, I think, in terms of a barrier to accountability with with the current situation. Um, I, so I don't know if you were referring to that a little bit, uh, Booker, <clears throat> but um, the, you know, it, it certainly makes sense to me that, and from what I've read that, that having a, a new department or um, <clears throat> is, is a, a, you know, here's a quote I have, um, they call it an office of neighborhood safety, but a, a quote is an office of neighborhood safety gives cities a way to embed community-based safety solutions into the fabric of government while still maintaining necessary distance between interventions and the justice system. Um, and, you know, it can also, you know, can function as a hub for all the non-punitive approaches to public safety. Um, so that, that I would, I don't, that, Maybe that's that's not really necessarily information, uh, but it's information gained from how other cities are doing it, and I think I think uh, how we we should recommend to do it. Are there other comments, uh, Carol? You were going to say more, and I cut you off to move to Javier. Do you have more comments? Uh, not at this point, no. I was, tr uh, Michael, please go ahead. I wanted to ask um, Carol uh, about when you were, you were talking about the, the steps, um, the, the things that, that a CAHOOTS model would respond to. Uh, and you talked about people that were being threatened. And I wonder if you could just expand on that because I'd like to understand what you mean. Um, I mean, I think the other things that you mentioned uh, were were pretty obvious, um, but in terms of people that are feeling threatened, I just wanted to get an understanding. Are you talking about like an active threat? Like how does, I just, if you can just explain that a little bit, sorry. I'm not clear that uh, the team responds to <clears throat> home-based, you know, interpersonal violence. Uh, my impression is that they respond to more things that occur within um, houseless community where there's, um, you know, physical aggression and, and threat. I'm not absolutely clear about that. I think it's an interesting, it's, it's an important question because if they have, Alex, did you have a comment on that? Oh, um, I, I think it's an important question because uh, you know, there, is, uh, there is the question of um, the role of the policing um, in, um, in, being prime, in, in being first responders in, um, as a team here in Northampton uh, in domestic violence and you know, so I think it's important for us to look at what other cities are doing and whether it's still under the umbrella of, of, of police, of armed police. Alex, please. Yeah, so I just posted in the chat a document I found useful, which was an analysis of the CAHOOTS program uh, by the Eugene uh, Police Department. And so it, it talks about the diversion that they do, um, how often a uh, a co-response or rather a, usually it's, you know, that, yeah, there's a co-response or a backup response. Um, and so how often those, those happen in different um, cases and um, then just their analysis of, you know, that, that it's a, um, their summary is 
that, that CAHOOTS is a valued partner within the city of Eugene, provides a needed service within the community. Um, so the, um, so that, that I found that, that analysis uh, useful. Thank you for that. What, what gets complicated in this is sort of what's in the data and what's not in the data. And I think we've even heard that there are a lot of calls that 911 never sends to the police of distress that they hear from people and they talk people down or they refer people to their therapists and everything else. Um, you know, sort of what the police and what, unfortunately, what we end up hearing about are, as what was discussed on Monday evening, sort of calls to where there's a question of competency, should people be section 12? Those are real crisis. You know, there's might be suicidal behavior, there may be homicidal behavior. Um, and I've got to say in preparation for this evening, reading messages of, you know, if we improved mental health services so that we didn't get to that point, that would be a better thing. And should money be redirected? One of the things, just to give this as a way to begin to think about stuff is I got a comment from one of our um, community organizers who went back to Rachel Bromberg and just looked at sort of what is Montreal, uh, pardon me, Toronto spending on refunding mental health response. And she sent me a document that said for Toronto, which is obviously much larger than Northampton, we've allocated 8 million to a pilot program. This is mental health response. In Eugene, Oregon, it's 2.1 million. In Olympia, Washington, which is 50,000 people, which is a little bit more than double the population of Northampton, it's 500,000. So they sent us a guess that funding mental health services as a response is somewhere between half a million and a million dollars. Um, I don't know how to think about that in terms of is that money up, above what's being sent, spent at now for um, our agencies who are currently doing this work or is this something different, but I'm, I'm putting that out there as a number um, just to begin to think about. Um, uh, obviously, I don't know, does that on top of the ServiceNet contract, is that on top of the, um, I always forget their first, their first initial, the dot .SCO contract. Um, so, but I'm giving you that as a number. Um, and I have no idea if does that include retraining of 911 services or alternative services, but I'm, I'm getting a number out there for you. And it's from Rachel Bromberg sort of making a guess in terms of our scale and what might be going on. Carol. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that uh, the police department is not doing crisis assessments for suicidality or homicidality in general. They may be the first responder, uh, but the CSO clinical and support options currently holds the state contract for crisis teams, uh, mobile crisis teams. Uh, in some cases that mean, in a lot of cases, that means that someone gets transported either by a family member or <clears throat> or police um, to Cooley Dickinson uh, emergency room where they're met by the crisis uh, evaluator to see, uh, you know, ascertain what level of care, uh, to make a, make a judgment about what level of care is needed. So it's not the case. So, I mean, the budgetary stuff is, it's gonna be through the contract with CSO. Um, it's not something that, you know, certainly the clinical piece of the work is, is not typically being done by the police. I'm responding to the fact that um, the person from CSO said that they were pleased by the fact that when the police contact an individual, they actually call CSO and ask for advice mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. should they person be section 12. Mm -hmm. um, 
though it doesn't sound like that the current model necessarily includes asking a therapist to come and do part of that assessment. No, no, a, a number of your professional categories have the ability, have the ability to detain and transport, mm -hmm. um, but the, um, the it, transport for an assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other comments or thoughts about this? And is the budgetary figure I threw out to you helpful or distracting or disruptive? Yeah. <laughs> Dan. Yeah, no, I mean that's that's sort of, you know, I I'd gone um, and watched some of the some of the things um, that Rachel has done and sort of looking at, you know, because this isn't we're not the only place that's even considered this, <laughs> um, you know, and the, these programs have typically been, you know, as soon as you start to talk about alternative, and this isn't anything new, right, Cahoots isn't new, but even, you know, a couple of years ago, so like Dallas's program, which is a much larger city than ours, they were handling a much larger call volume, you know, they were doing a, a co-responder program, but their pilot was 1.5 million. Um, Dasher, <clears throat> which a lot of people are, are sort of you know, citing is also another one that's a co-responder um, model, but this is not to get too far into it, but um, one of the things that I think for us is to sort of think about sort of what, and, and so this, this conversation was really helpful thinking about what are the other contracts um, that the city is going to need to look at. Um, I think especially when it comes to, you know, if these become city employees, then there's city oversight there. <laughs> um, and so for us, you know, some of this is going to be, you know, dependent on what the mayor and the city council also do, right? So like we, I don't think we'll have like a single one number that's like, this is the holy grail and what we'll spend, but to just think about what some of these costs are and where the funding might be able to come from, from that, like, you know, certain things just allocating money in the budget, <laughs> um, you know, as a simple answer, you know, as a more complex one, I don't know, we've talked about this a little bit, right, detail pay, uh, the city takes a chunk of money from that, uh, from detail work. Um, so allocating a portion of that to fund, you know, either a new department or some of these positions um, and things like that might be useful. Um, but again, you know, it comes down to what the structure of that department is. Um, so I think it's just, it's really useful to hear what you've all been thinking of and looking at. So um, Javier, is your hand still up or I can't tell? Please, then go ahead, please. Uh, I have a question for uh, the, uh, the, so the other subcommittee. Um, are we clear how much percentage or how much money within the police budget comes from uh, federal estate grants and how much money comes from the city. And I'm asking that from the point of view that um, in, in the same way how we were talking about money coming to, to service providers with ties to the police department or to the DA office, that's money that suddenly when we're talking about the possibility of divest and reinvest that cannot be moved because it's not under the purview of the city. And I think that would be important to, to take a look to, into it. Does someone from the committee have an answer? Dan, do you have an answer to that? It looks like Michael might have a better answer than mine. Well, I just I just grabbed the the budget that we were sent that the council was sent from the mayor uh, last year in May to look and you know when you look at I'll just I'll just point one thing out to you when you look at veteran services, um, is that a good one? Um, let me find the the recreation department because I know it's in there. When you look at the recreation department. I'm just going to hold this up here and try to point this out without spilling my tea. Um, that there's all of this uh, is the pay on this side, and over here is the city expense. But right here is listed some grants that pay 
or some other funding, I should say, not grants, other funding that pays for some of the rec department people. When you look at the police department budget, it doesn't break out anything separate for um, funding here. So there may be those things, but they're not identified in this document. Uh, you know, to, so that's the best answer I have for that at this point. If that's, if that's something that um, would be worth uh, requesting to... Oh. So, I'm sorry to cut you off, Javier, but I, we got the budgets from the police department for 2010, 2011, and 2012. Um, and I don't understand why we couldn't get a more recent police budget. Did more recent police budgets get sent to you, Michael? Those are, those are right on uh, the city website uh, back to 2013. Before that, they weren't. Uh, accessible on they're right on the mayor's page of the website so the ones before that they had to send us separately because they weren't, weren't on the website sorry I didn't understand that thank you Carol I'm asking to unmute Carol yes what's the problem uh Oh, okay. my hand, my hand want, is still, uh, I should yeah. take my hand down. Okay, sorry. Javier. So with that, I think it would be important for us to give, if, if to understand if there is any allocation of separated money based on grants or money from the city. Because at the end of the day, as I just said, anything coming from grants with uh, having to fulfill a strict requirements for the grant to be given it's money that the city cannot touch or 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 oh, no let me say it. it's money that city may not want to touch the other option is just uh surrendering the the grant i mean but but i think it would be good for us to understand a little bit the money that can be moved and money that cannot be moved. Yeah. Are there other thoughts or comments about that? Can I ask a weirder question? Should we be thinking about, here's what we think we need to fund what we think we need without talking about where it comes from? Um, I mean, one strategy is to say, we're gonna remove this from a police budget. Um, another strategy is to say, here's what it costs, and we're going to ask the city to figure out how to reconfigure things to make that occur. Um, should we be making that kind of proposal, or does that sit someplace else? And um, Dan's hand went up first, and then Michael's, so let's go with that. Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the things that, I, that I've come looking at, you know, sort of what proposals are, are put out there and, and sort of for a logical sense for me, it's really been trying to figure out what the city spends on different services. Um, and one of the things that I would like to see is that the city continues to fund those services. It takes care of those as a responsibility and how <laughs> in what department, um, those are the considerations. But if you're moving responsibilities from one department to another, from one group to another, that the funds for that move with it, but it's not like a, I, you know, I would be concerned to say, oh, we need, you know, $700,000 to fund this thing. And so you should just take that money right from a particular department. I don't think that's necessarily the way to go. I think tying, you know, value, you know, costs associated with the expenditures, whatever you want to call them, you know, depending on how you're looking at this, but whatever that expenditure is, to cover that responsibility goes where that responsibility does so that the responsibility is still funded. Um, you know, and it, it, that's how this sort of works in a lot of ways, right? Like animal control wasn't always in one department, or it wasn't always under the police, it moved. Um, and it looks like there was movement of funds with that as well as, you know, as much as I can tell um, through the budgets. And so, you know, if it moved out of there, you know, really simple, like animal control is pretty, pretty basic one. Most departments don't have that within the police. Um, you can move that, you know, look at how much time people are spending responding to animal control and move that, that funding. Um, you're not saying that, you know, I think we've all hit this, like there's no 
there's there's no you know July first there's no police <laughs> um, for this year for you know several years down the road, um, but that also gives you that flexibility to sort of plan you know a phased approach as well right so that you're not striking down a department sort of you know or, or really hurting their ability to respond um, by requiring a quick pivot of a ton of different things. Thank you, Dan. I know I, Michael, I said I was gonna call you next, but I'm gonna call Josie because he's been relatively quiet. So Josie, please. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, kind of what, uh, adding on to the things that Dan has very clearly um, laid out for us, um, a lot of what we do in the, in the spending contracts um, subcommittee is kind of look at what aspects of the police budget um, could be reallocated in the purposes of making sure those responsibilities, uh, there's no shortfall, right? Um, what we do here is not in an attempt to, you know, make it less expensive or save money. We still want people to have access to these um, resources, to these um, responsibilities with there being no stopgap, um, uh, hopefully no stopgap at all, right? There's no there's a smooth transition of responsibilities and funding. Um, and we've looked at several ways of maybe some form of phrase approach and to the form of funding for a potential new department. Um, and it's really, I think, uh, important that if we do end up uh, advocating for this new department that it is properly funded and it has the legs to stand while also making sure that any responsibilities that the police currently do, they still do until there is a replacement for it that is, um, is solidly laid out. And so um, a phase approach and a, a very strong pilot while looking at um, what can immediately be reallocated and what sorts of uh, alternative revenue streams such as like detail work, uh, a freezing on um, police salaries, um, a freezing of police hirings um, can be done. Um, in, in an attempt to make sure that this new department and these new alternatives can be funded and that there is no uh, negative impact to the community at all. Thank you. Joe. I'm, I'm going to ask, call on Michael, but I'm going to actually want to come back to Josie or someone else from the committee to sort of inform the alternatives committee perhaps about what funding do you think could move out of the police department from what you've already seen. So before we go to that, Michael, can you... Yeah, I, I, I am. I actually, Josie and Dan, between the two of them, covered pretty much what I was going to say. So you can move forward to the next thing. Okay. So, um, would you? Is it possible, Josie or someone else from your committee, to tell us what funding do you think could move out of policing at the at present without? Um, I'm looking for phrasing around this. Um, I don't have a frame. Do you see funding that could come out of the out of the depart police department at the moment? Josie, go ahead. I, I think you have to unmute Josie. Thanks for that. Uh, I think there's a couple different alternative uh, um, kind of approaches that we could take. One, uh, for example, is the recent um, uh, police officers who have retired or who have who have left. Right, there are a bunch of. Um, Un, quote unquote unfilled positions um, that we could, uh, you know, advocate or for the uh, immediate uh, hiring freezes for those positions, which would mean that that, that part of the, the budget is kind of left up in the air, which would then potentially secure uh, the funds for any uh, social worker or peer responder who we would then hopefully fill a position in uh, some form of peer led uh, model, right? So there's immediately some. Um, movable uh, personnel funding right there. Uh, there's also the uh, police vehicles, for example. We've seen that uh, many vehicles are being replaced at a pretty rapid rate. And if we do end up uh, kind of advocating for a shift of responsibilities with a, a somewhat equivalent shift of funding, what we might see is that instead of funding for new uh, police vehicles every few years, you know, maybe we move those uh, some, some traffic responsibilities over to the DPW or some form of transportation um, department. Um, there's really a lot of kind of shifting of responsibilities that, you know, in the past may have belonged to different departments and now belong to the policing. Um, but there are things like the, uh, that, that, those are the ones that are immediately coming to my head, but we've definitely talked about a lot more if anyone wants to fill in any other ones that we've discussed. Does anyone else from 
that committee have other ideas about that? Um, maybe not necessarily a different idea, but um, additional ideas, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but just a little more context for things like, um, you know, it wasn't until, I mean, fairly recently, the police were replacing one, um, three vehicles a year and they shifted to four. Um, you know, just shifting back to that three, uh, the three vehicle replacements, um, that, that's $100,000 or so, give or take. Um, so there, there are certain things that could be scaled back, but the largest part of the police budget is, you know, by far is the, um, the personnel time or personnel hours. Um, you know, our department, uh, if you just go by the, by the number of employees that are budgeted for, <laughs> um, is actually pretty large. Um, in terms of the number of employees that they actually have, um, you know, with, with some people still being trainees and never actually like setting foot and working in Northampton, never being on patrol. Um, it goes down a bit and then they, you know, they have vacation and things to think about. Um, but one of the things that is important to note is that the NPD strives for a five person staffing per shift um, as their minimum, but they actually don't usually hit that minimum. Um, you know, they've got enough funding for more than that per shift. Um, but you know, when we asked sort of what the rationale was, like why you would have that, what response, and I think you asked for this as well, you know, what response time do you aim for, those sort of things. The answer is like, we don't really have a response time as a formula. We don't have a formula for staffing, um, either the whole department or by shift. And, you know, sort of, so then it leaves it as sort of like, well, it's just intuition, you know, so this isn't necessarily something that we can do. Um, you know, as a, as a commission. Um, so we want to think of what, um, what does that mean? You know, what is a good staffing level? And I think we want to expand that to what is a good staffing level for safety? Um, so not just for the police department, but if you're going to have substance use, um, mental health crisis, right, they're going to respond to things that a police officer wouldn't respond to. Um, you know, so we can still have more than five, I would love more than five emergency responders on at any time. Um, and, and sort of thinking of it in that sense, um, you know, and positions, I mean, some of the things like crossing guards and, and other things that are budgeted for in the police department, um, could those also be transferred to, if there's a department of community safety, transferring that those roles and the funds with that as well. But again, it really does depend on that overall picture. Um, and I don't know, I don't like to look at like the personnel or like the, the department itself as just one pot of money to take things from without really specifying what the responsibility is, how that, that's calculated, which is actually really difficult with the logs that the police keep um, to do sort of mathematically to just say what, how much, you know, what's the dollar cost, you know, for these activities um, become sort of tricky <laughs> uh, when you don't have, you know, even hour by hour accounting. So um, yeah, I think that's just the, the context there is that it's gonna take a lot of math. Um, in theory, <laughs> a lot of it would be up for sort of movement, but again, it has to be a responsible path to do it. Um, Josie, do you have more to say about this or something different? Yeah, just, just to add a little bit more to it. Um, so a wall that we've kind of hit a couple of times in um, our subcommittee um, meeting is, you know, what what is the justification for the police budget being what it is currently, right? Um, what metrics are they using? Um, and something that we really look forward to if the proposal is for uh, a new department is, um, you know, if we move these services, these really vital services such as mental health, uh, any form of crisis, drug related, uh, you know, interactions with our, our most marginalized communities, what we hope is that, yes, we'll be moving the, the responsibility and some funds over in order to do those things, but that those services will then be utilized by more of the community, thus having an even greater impact, right, uh, which would then 
provide Northampton, like if, if a pilot is done correctly, it would provide Northampton with the sort of metrics and data to kind of justify like, oh, look at this, look at all these new people who are using all these new services that we've now removed from the from the responsibilities of the police and put them into this new kind of department of public safety. And, um, you know, to uh, some people's points there that those departments, those types of initiatives, they are far and few between. Uh, a lot of them show some pretty promising stuff, but again, it's, it's in its nascency in terms of actual metrics. But when compared to the metrics that we have of our current policing model, they're really not too different because, I mean, to be quite frank, to find out what has justified uh, the police budget as it is right now is kind of uh, not ubiquitous, ambiguous, ambiguous is the word I'm looking for. Um, it just seems as if, you know, we've kind of combed over about a decade's worth of uh, what are they called budgets and it kind of just seems like we just continue aside from the obvious quality of life increases to the police budget that we've kind of just continued to increase the police budget out of tradition and not actually looking at the metrics such as response times such as how many community members are are asking for particular services um but a switch to a peer-led responder model under this new um sort of uh department of public safety we would then be a starting fresh with a new kind of base of data. And I think that's something to look into, to say the least. Thank you. I'm curious, do any of the, yes, Alex, I was about to ask if any of the members of the alternatives committee had questions about this discussion that's going on at the moment. Alex, please. Sure, yeah, I just had a comment um, that, you know, as of last year, it was $6.9 million proposed for the police department that was reduced. Um, to just about six. Um, and um, I think it's important that we explicitly state that we, we consider that 6.9 million plus cost of living to be a level funding of public safety. Um, I mean, there's a lot more that's funded for public safety, such as the fire department, uh, but that, you know, that, that that not be seen as, well, now it's six now it's six million and then that is is our new normal so to to recognize that that 882,000 which with a cost of living increase would be nine hundred thousand dollars and then you know the existing six million for the police would have a cost of living increase but th that those continue forward um, and that nine hundred thousand be used to establish a new department to establish um, so for this coming year uh, is at, at a minimum um, to, to, to frame it that way, I think uh, would be helpful because there's, there's no way that had the cut not happened last year that the mayor would in this year propose a cut uh, for, the, for the police department. I just don't see that happening. Um, so it's important to kind of re, 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 have that be a, a refrain of the, the narrative that if you were going to spend this much, let's make sure we continue to spend this much, but on different things. I'm sitting on that for a bit, Alex. That's a marvelous suggestion. Um, before I call on Dan, Carol or Javier, do you have a comment? I, I, I do, but I'm, 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 as you say, I'm trying to sort of process what Alex said. Um, <laughs> what he just said was pretty, um, I don't want to use the sixties word like deep. Um, um, there was a lot in what you just suggested that hasn't been brought up yet. So that I'm, yeah, <laughs> let me, let me give Carol a shot while the, while the rest of us stay starstruck by what you just said. I guess I wasn't so starstruck, unless I misunderstand. I, you, um, check me if I'm wrong, uh, Alex. You were you were talking about perhaps putting in a just a zero funding recommendation, but making certain that the eight hundred eighty three thousand or two thousand that got set aside be allocated directly to. The, the, the first phase of building a new department, which would make the fundraising 
uh, through various grants, not such an onerous task. I mean, we're talking about a few, probably, you know, let's just say a few hundred thousand dollars. And am I on the right path with this or? Um, that Carol, that's what I heard. And it's the first time I, so what I'm resonating with is it's the first time I've heard that perhaps that funding should be set aside to the forming of a new department of safety, some department, new department, whatever that means. Okay. okay. Now, Dan, you've been waiting. And so now I'm going to call on you. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of what we've been talking about in our subcommittee, right? Which is that you, you can't just take the 10% that was cut and have that be the only fund that you put into this. It would need to be a continual amount. Um, and that the whole point of that initial cut and the, um, the sort of the, the concern, and I think the, the, council, the, the council did this pretty well was to establish that's not like a, it's not in response to a budgetary shortfall, although you know, 20, uh, 2020 is gonna wreak havoc with city budgets for a while, I think, in terms of um, both state funding and, and their own. Um, so I think that's, that's gonna be interesting, but our, <clears throat> sorry, one of the, the funding sources that we had was that continual commitment of some funds from the city. Um, you know, again, not, not necessarily tying them to just that, but to say, hey, that's available. Um, and, you know, in our initial report, you know, the, the concern was that some of that, let me phrase that, none of that money had been reallocated specifically to, um, to deal with concerns about safety, um, which is, you know, not necessarily the spirit in which it was made. <laughs> um, so I think we're still, we're still operating on that assumption that there would be funding available for this. Um, I think there's still, you know, if there's a full-fledged department just doing some of like the, like um, looking at there's a, there's a sort of public, public department calculator that sort of goes over like the, the groundwork um, of those things. And I've been playing around with it, playing with numbers and thinking about like what it would be or what it could be, but you know, it gets to be pretty expensive um, depending on what's required and what they're doing. Um, and so it's also, if we're thinking phase, multiple phases of these approaches, you know, it also becomes important that both the mayor and the, the council um, you know, think about what those, what the future costs will be too, <laughs> um, as they're starting to imagine this. I don't think, I don't think that you could have a department that's doing all of what we've discussed. And I'd say all like at the, you know, phase, whatever, really far down the line, doing all of those responsibilities for, you know, under a million, <laughs> um, in terms of the cost for the city. Um, but I think the, I think it's nice to hear that others are thinking the same way that that money would still be available and continue and that the, there wouldn't be a, a, just an increase back to the same sort of budget space that the department was in last year, that, um, that we continue that as a commitment. Thank you, Dan. Javier. Yeah, I then said sort of stated portions of what I want to say. So I'm going to try to say something else. Uh, I uh, one of the things that I got from what Alex said, it's you know pro, uh, there is almost a certainty that I mean, Narkowitz will not go again without with a budget cut for the police department. Is that correct? Repeat that, please. That the mayor would not go as in the last budget session. He would not go again for a, for cutting the police department budget as an option to anything. Is that correct? You, well, yeah. You mean like, for example, if if last year there hadn't been a cut to the police department, I'm sure that Mayor Narkowitz would just have increased that um, six point nine million by the cost of living and proposed the next one, uh, if if not more. So uh, that. For, yeah, is that clear? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, there are two things to this. The first one is the, 
So hopefully the commission was created to recommend something that any any commission recommendation doesn't matter what it is in relationship to in this case policing or others it's going to involve money. <laughs> so that's not really I mean the formation of the commission by itself meant that there was going to be something that was going to happen in relation to act to concrete action. The the certainty that something was going to happen in concrete action meant that there was going to have to be money reallocated or allocated. So I'm, I'm starting from that. So hopefully the mayor or the city council, if we come out with a concrete number or not, uh, that would not be a deterrent for our uh, proposal to be shut down because it's like, it's like me telling my wife, let's go to Chile. And after that, she says, okay, buy the tickets. No, no, I didn't mean tickets. It's just, let's go to Chile. So when I'm, in, when I'm saying something, I'm implying a lot of stuff. And the creation of a commission to recommend changes within the city comes attached in any level with reallocation or allocation of money, implicitly. Hopefully, we can start making that explicit. And the second thing is, I want to keep pushing back against these grants um, because, because of the reasons just I said before. I do feel that this has to be a fully funded city project, not depending on grants or anything that would deem the, the department uh, running out of money in two, three years. Uh, that's dangerous. I think the, the city has a responsibility if it buys into the creation of a new department. Um, so I, I want to push back a little bit in relation to, to, to grants. Thank you, Javier. Um, Josie, do you have another comment to make? Sure, just to kind of add on to what Javier is saying, some, something that we've definitely discussed in our subcommittee meetings is um, what would the funding of this department look like? And I think though grants are a nice idea and, and will be applied wherever possible, uh, we, I think I can speak and please anyone on this subcommittee correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think I can say that we think that if a department is in fact uh, kind of going to be our recommendation that it is solidly funded, right? Uh, for many reasons, the grants could be pulled out at some point, uh, thus leaving uh, many of our community members without services that they definitely need um and would kind of um uh, yeah would probably be have bad consequences uh it's really important that if we are going to be shifting these responsibilities to a new department that that funding is secure that it's stable so that there is no um kind of there's no dropping of the ball if you will uh for what these um peer-led um organizations will be providing for our um community Thank you. I, by the way, I'm just going to put into the ether here that grants are a good thing. Grants can also be a difficult thing. Um, we sometimes when age, when things that are good are tied through grants that run through certain organizations, it inhibits other organizations' ability to move. So, for instance, the restorative justice grant runs through the police. Um, which some of us don't think is the right way to run that kind of a grant. Um, we've had difficulty getting input from agencies who feel constrained because of their grant financial structures in terms of their ability to describe what's going on has made things difficult. So um, thinking about how grant, uh, some of the legal things that have been filed by Lindsay Sabadosa are for mental health agencies specifically not to run through police departments, sort of a recognition of these complexities. Um, but you know, I I don't I have sort of had this the, the I had this thought that city agencies don't run through grants, um, and and I'm learning that I'm wrong about that, and that a lot of what's important that cities do. Um, actually are very dependent on grants from grant agencies and how they occur. So that's a complicated thing. I, I, I just wanna say that what Josie just said is really important that you don't want 
a department to be dependent on the next grant. Um, and that that's a difficult thing. So uh, we have 30 minutes to go in this meeting before I call on Carol. Um, I want people to start thinking about what things do we wanna sort of tie up as part of this discussion before we end this meeting. Um, so I'm gonna talk, turn to Carol, but I'd like part of your brains to be listening to Carol and part of your brains to be thinking about where we, what we need to get done before 8.30. Carol, thank you. Yeah, so I'll be short. Just, uh, I know that it's been said that, you know, this bill that uh, Lindsay Sabadoso has a spot, been the chief sponsor for, is is has only been introduced. It, it hasn't made it through both houses. It hasn't gone to the governor's desk. Um, but one of the things in taking a look at it, uh, what I realized is that it asks for uh, grant applications from uh, community, either units of local government, but in partnership with, as you just said, Booker, mental health organizations, or you know any other community-based organization, or a nonprofit or a public institution of higher learning, like a state college or state university. So, you know, it's possible that one of the things we hadn't talked about here, in terms of sources of money, running money through other entities that 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 provide more funding, contracted funding for this project could be through a community mental health, you know, through a community uh, health agency or through a community mental health agency. And I know that there's been a lot of testimony that, um, delivered during the time that this commission has functioned uh, with some negativity expressed about the existing um, programs, professional programs. But I think we, I just wanna say that if we are really going to get into how do the pieces, puzzle pieces come together to create enough funding, like a million plus to do this, um, I think we do need to consider existing contracts for, for crisis and how that money flows from the state. Like right now, I mean, it's not like a new application uh, for more funding. Thank you, Carol. Alex. Uh, just a quick note that I think grants can be especially useful in the startup phase um, and for training. So for example, you know, if we're starting up and training a whole bunch of people, um, in both for the crisis response and also for dispatch that, uh, you know, it, getting a grant for that, but then making sure we have ongoing city funding for everything that would continue to recur. Thank you for that, Alex. That's an important thought. Dan. Yeah, I just want to give a little, um, just to say, I don't think we need to specify what exactly so, you know, th this is one of the things, our commission doesn't have the power to make the city do anything, right? We are just giving them the possible solutions. What they adopt is gonna, what the, what the city does uh, is gonna inform sort of how much money they need, uh, how much, um, you know, or what contracts need to be, you know, reorganized or, or renegotiated um, or even ended or started um, for new agencies. And so I think for, us, it's just giving giving them as many options and avenues, um, but also thinking about, you know, and making sure that our, when we're giving them a, oh, you might want to look at X, Y, and Z source, that it's something that might be adequate. Uh, I think that's what, that was like our concern, or my concern, is that I don't want it to be necessarily incumbent on just the city council and the, the mayor, you know, after we've done all of this work, to sort of look at it and go, well, I don't know where that's going to come from. <laughs> um, and, you know, so that's, that's some of that is just making sure that we've got that. But I don't think we have to specify, you know, exactly how much it'll be. Um, as long as we know, like, oh, well, if it costs roughly this, you know, in some permutation, okay, this is where that money could come from, but making sure that it is something that the city can, can fund. Um, that's all. Thank you, Dan. That's really helpful. Um, I, we now have 21 minutes left. Um, are there, you know, if you asked me, I would say maybe we should talk about what we think a new department might look 
like. Um, but I'm um, obviously, if other people think more other types of questions would be more important at this point, I'm fine with that. Alex, please. Oh, um, I uh, wonder if we if the alternatives committee could have a few minutes it could be at the end, um, just to discuss again who's writing what because I think there are a few things that we haven't assigned. That's fine. So um, we will. Tr um, before we just, I agree, I want that to happen. Um, are there other thoughts of what people would like to have happen before we end our meeting at 830? Let me ask a really hard question then. Josie, Michael, and Dan, have the Alternatives Committee given you enough information to help you with your thought process? Yeah, this was really helpful to be able to talk through some of these things. Okay. Do you have any additional questions for us? Because otherwise we'll take the next few minutes talking about some issues about writing. Um, no, I just put in a reminder about scheduling upcoming meetings, but I think we can do that just at the end. Okay. Um, there have been a number of people on this message. Um, I've been communicating with them individually. Um, we, they, um, public comment occurred at the beginning of this meeting. I'm glad that you've all stayed here and listened to this discussion. I'm sorry that you can't participate in the discussion that's going on in the meeting. I wanna remind you that your voices are important and I'm hoping you will be there on Saturday when there will be a longer public comment session um, so that we can hear your voices in a um, real and immediate way. Um, Alex, Let's talk about the writing of what we're doing. Did you have specific questions about the writing issues? Sure, yeah. So the, the, of the phases, uh, the, the items we, I described at the beginning, mm. uh, we know who's writing mental health crisis response, housing first, substance use, domestic violence. But I realized we didn't um, specify who's going to elaborate further on the resilience hub, on civilian flaggers, on restorative transformers justice programs and on the traffic wellness checks, et cetera, sections. Now, I don't necessarily know that we're going to write a lot about those things. Um, most of them are in phase two, but um, we should it, at least write a few paragraphs uh, about the, the further work. So be before we said, by the way, Javier and I spoke outside of this meeting um, could I just add in, Javier, would you mind saying what you're going to be writing about? Because um, just so that Carol and Alex know about that. Sure. Um, sure. I was going to say something else, but yes. So, um, so the section that I wrote in the preliminary report that the subcommittee uh, created um, was the full context and now what I'm going to be writing more is again about the context from where we start before we started to now and also I'm going to be working in the appendix and probably we're also going to be work I'm going to be working in citations including citation of testimonies okay. um so can I move on now to what what Alex just brought up um you're right, Alex, we have not, ass I'm, I do not have in my notes that we've assigned to anybody to talk about those issues. And frankly, all I, I have in my notes is that they're on an outline of issues we would like to discuss in a phase two way. Um, so they're unassigned. Um, are, Is there, how should we manage that? One would be someone volunteering to write more about this. A second possibility would be 
um, simply outlining issues that we think are important, but we have not dealt with yet. I, uh, by the way, I'm uncomfortable about that, that because there's domestic violence that we don't have firm convictions about, but we've talked a lot about. <laughs> then there's some of the issues you just named, Alex, that have always been on our edge, but we've never really discussed. Um, so that needs some kind of differentiation. Do you have thoughts? Well, I know that some of the other committees have also talked about, uh, you know, the issue of civilian flaggers or traffic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if, if perhaps there's writing that they have already done or are considering doing in, in those areas. I don't know, Dan, if you have a sense of what each um, committee will be writing, like which specific areas they, they are focusing on, if there's any overlap. Dan? <laughs> be respectful and raise my hand. Um, I don't know exactly what they're going to recommend. Um, I mean, the policies and services just spent the last couple of meetings drafting this this document about um, responsibilities that they see like staying within the police department or that they could see like um, easily transferring or things that would be difficult to transfer. Um, and so one of them, and you're gonna have to forgive my pandemic brain, uh, 15 hour days have taken their toll. Um, I don't remember exactly where um, detail work fit on that. Um, I do know that domestic violence is on there um, as a responsibility that would stay with the police, um, you know, for the foreseeable future anyway. Um, but I would be surprised if it was anything else. Um, or sorry, I would be surprised if it was, they were gonna say, oh, policy change, you can just move everything, um, that service right out. Um, the detail work I'm not sure where they would land and I think some of this also depends on you know what we were if we have a department <laughs> you know a department could work to make sure that it was city employees hired for those flagging things for those flagging opportunities uh, or maybe even make sure or ensure that detail work was you know open and available to anyone in the city um and so yeah the, the I, could, I, could write, I could write to David who's um, who's been thinking about differences in traffic details and see if, I know he just volunteered to do some writing for that committee, but I couldn't tell what the topics were gonna be. Um, so I can ask him if he has some writing or thoughts about that. He may say, sorry, no, um, but that's why I would, I, I know that this has been a concern that's been closer to his heart than ours. Um, so I can just ask him if, that's something he could do. Um, but in that meeting, he said he was going to concentrate on writing about a certain topic. And I'm sorry, I don't remember which one it was. I think it was traffic, um, but I, I'm not 100% sure. That's what I think too. So there were other issues, Alec. So could you say out loud again, the issues that you felt we had not one was traffic and you named a couple of others. Right, um, so the detail or civilian flaggers, um, restorative slash transformative justice programs. And I'm wondering, uh, I know Carol has done a bit of research there and wondering if Carol, what I'm thinking is we just write a couple paragraphs about, about each of these um, and including the resilience hub, which is in phase one, but which is already so much in progress and there's so much work being done in the city. I don't think we need to necessarily write a lot about that so, one. So to me, part of, I have stuff about the Resilience Hub and what I'm writing about housing. Um, okay. Because they're connected. Okay. There's part of the immediate and then there's. We'll put that under your name then. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Or uh, is that fair? Uh, it's I mean, fair. No, it's perfectly fair. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm making rhetorical humor. I'm volunteering to say I'm writing about Resilience Hub in a careful way. Were there other issues there? 
if uh, David Hoos is not writing about it, let me see what he says. I'll get okay. back. Yeah. Um, the other, so uh, other than traffic, which you're going to see uh, what he says, there's, there's wellness checks, noise and nuisance complaints, unarmed civilian investigator for insurance claims. I can I can write a summary of, of what other you know what other communities are looking into and in that and I can also write a summary of the civilian flagger rules um, and um, I guess my question for Carol is still out there as a question I'm, I'm curious are any of you on the other subcommittee writing about these some of these things have been integral parts of the new departments of safety that other cities have taken on. Um, and there are sort of robust discussions of <clears throat> these other facets that Alex is bringing up as being part of a department of safety and being removed from the police, being removed from weapon carrying people who do this work. Um, are any of you, is that going to be part of your um, writing of what you're going to say, or should that sit with us to do that kind of writing? Josie, uh, your hand is up, and I don't know if it's about an answer to this question or not. Yeah, well, it is a little bit. I, well, I think through the very nature of being part of the spending contracts, like there will be some form of tidbit about, like, you know, what is the economic impact of some of these uh, proposed uh, alternatives. Um, but on really quickly on the subject of uh, civilian flaggers, we have actually done a little bit of talk with the next committee about um, the benefit to uh, opening up detail work to uh, people of Northampton, um, both as a way to kind of uh, make sure that those detail works, those jobs do get done. Um, and that, uh, you know, those job opportunities are open to people of Northampton, as well as for those, like you've already pointed it out, that they that they be done by people who are not armed, essentially. Um, so we have we have like discussed that and, and aspects of that for sure. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments or thoughts about this, Alex? Thank you for the reminder about this. Um, we have eight minutes. Are um, there any other issues to be brought up? Yes, Alex. Sorry, um, do, I don't know if Carol, is Carol still here? Do you want to respond to my question about whether you want to write about restorative justice? She's figuratively here, but I'm not sure if she's literally here. Ah. Uh, Carol, could you unmute, please? I was just dealing with the usual daily emergencies here. Um, the question was what? Um, would you be interested in writing a few paragraphs about re uh, restorative justice? Um, yeah, I could. Yeah, for, I could. For our yeah. phase two recommendations. Yeah, for definitely for for study. Yeah, yeah, for for as a phase, as a phase two kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Sure. You've actually, you've actually already done some writing about it. So. I have. Okay. Yeah. Well, I deep in my notes, you have. Yeah, I I I could do that. Just just a short piece, right? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah, I need to go off again. I need to follow up here with. I think we're. I think we're right. just about done. So unless you want to stay to vote to in the meeting. Okay. Uh, you have my vote. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions or comments? Um, this has been a nice surprise getting to work with this other committee. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, I've got to say, uh, you know, I tried to stay out of the discussion. It's more fun talking about how to change things without really worrying about the money. Um, and it is like, I, I wanna to fly to Chile, but I don't wanna pay for it or think about the credit card cost. Um, and I've gotta say, I came to this meeting quite frightened about having to think about budgetary issues because um, part of it is what's the money, but also where does the money come from? Um, I actually think money is really fungible and um, it's up to somebody who's holding a larger budget to think about where am I gonna put this money? And it's not just, well, the police had it, but I'm gonna move it. it it's a little 
different than, or it can be different from that. Um, my political statement I'm going to make is I think the police have been very efficacious over many years of figuring out how to be funded for things. And it's really hard to figure out where that funding came from and why it's there, what it actually pays for. And I've been taken by other cities who defunded and it's zillions of dollars and no police have been fired and they have not reduced the size of the police departments. They've stopped growth, but they, so that means to me that there's a lot of money that's available. I, I've got to say, looking at the Northampton police budget, it's harder to see that. Um, but I think there's also a mood on the, at least on the part of Chief Casper, that there are things that her police people are doing that she doesn't think they should be doing. And the, um, the more we can do to help with getting the right people at the right places um, is a good thing. It's the hard part is the money. And that uh, that's the really hard part. That's why I've enjoyed not thinking about it. Any other final, now that I've made my spiritual political comment, are there any other thoughts or comments before we entertain a motion to adjourn? I need to do the scheduling. Also, I'm so ah, Noah. <laughs> Hi, I'm still here, I'm awake. I'm right in the minute this is worse than talking about money scheduling the next meeting <laughs> You're telling me listen all right <laughs> <laughs> all right when, when are we meeting are we meeting as joint <laughs> so the next the, <laughs> let me just make certain i have this right the next full committee is tuesday this is the yeah. entire police committee we also have scheduled ourselves for a meeting, the whole police commission for next Friday, yeah. which is around um, documents and looking at documents that have been submitted. Mm -hmm. I don't think, now I'm speaking for the alternatives committee. I don't think we have another meeting scheduled. Um, if we did, we would probably be trying to meet on next Wednesday evening, but I don't think we've formally scheduled that. Yes, Alex. Uh, would 7.30 to 9 p.m. work on that Wednesday the 10th? I guess that's your way of saying we should meet. Um, that would work for me. Carol, would that be okay for you? Yes. <laughs> glad you came back from your other class. Javier. Well, yeah. that, that would be the 10th, right? Let me check. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, what time do you say, Alex? Uh, 7.30 to 9. Yeah. This meeting, um, theoretically, we should have already submitted writing to Dan. Um, am I right about that? Or do we want to go over writing at that meeting, Alex? Uh, I thought that writing was due Friday, this Friday. Yes, that's right. So that's if we're meeting next Wednesday, that's why I'm asking what the agenda for this meeting on Wednesday would be. Um, to rewrite, to, to re after we've gotten feedback on okay. the Tuesday meeting, the full commission meeting, um, to do our re rewrites in preparation for the Friday the 12th meeting. That was my, be my understanding. Dan, is that thinking correct? Yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Alex, for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Is that all right with everyone? Mm -hmm. Quick question. Yes. Question. In in drafting, in uh, getting all these drafts together, uh, the language should say what? The commission fill in the blank, even though it hasn't been approved? Commission recommends? I think... Um, I keep writing, we recommend. We recommend, okay. That's what I keep writing. Okay. Do you think that's reasonable, Alex, or should do you think it should be something different than that? Well, that sounds good to me, or, or we suggest if it's a little more tentative. If it's more tentative, yeah. yeah if we're not ready As to opposed to a firm recommendation, yeah. I, uh, and I, I, I want to work, so for instance, when I'm writing about housing first, Mm -hmm. I'm saying I recommend. And 
and if I'm talking about a cahoots model, I'm saying I recommend. Um, then there are other things that I'm suggesting because I'm not sure of what I'm doing. I, I think we ought to be thoughtful about what we feel strongly about and what. And later the pronoun gets changed, yes. right? Yeah. If it gets approved. Okay. Yeah. Well, this Dan will probably tell us what the pronouns ought to be later. Yeah. Javier, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking that it's going to, I, I don't, do not envy Cynthia or Dan for starters, <laughs> because they are going to get all this. But also, I just want to put this out there. I mean, in, in the recommendation that we're doing, when we're talking about, you, you mentioned Booker Cahoots. Uh, uh, we are proposing non-coercive right. paternalizing models, right? I, I just want to be really clear about that, right? You just said something much more. Thank you for, yes, you're right. You are more correct than I am. Mm -hmm. If I can say it that way. Okay, so I just I just want to make make it explicit that we are recommending a model, whatever that model is, mm -hmm. that is not coercive or paternalistic and in, infantilizing affected communities, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That, right. That's 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 the only thing. Right. That that covers it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I'm appreciate. That's my way of appreciating what you just said. So. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing but love for you. Um, okay, um, so the alternatives meeting is meeting next on seven thirty next Wednesday. Um, does the, our partner committee have any of this kind of information that you want to do before we end this session? Uh, I think we are also going to be scheduling a, a meeting. Uh, maybe just to touch base about where to go in terms of uh, what we'll be writing in term, uh, with your recommendations and things that are set on Tuesday for sure. Um, Dan and Michael, do you want to solidify 5.30 to 7.30 uh, that same Wednesday? I can't um, meet that day. I have a, there's another city meeting around uh, river swimming uh, that I need to attend because there's a beach in Ward 1 that I need to attend to. Sure. Um, I could meet Thursday, the 11th, if, if you both are free. Uh, I can do Thursday. Yeah, that should work for me. Same time, okay. 5.30 to 7.30. Sounds fine. Thanks. Thanks for okay. adjusting that. Yep. So it sounds good. I will send uh, the agenda to Noah promptly. But that, besides that, I think that's all we have to discuss here tonight, unless anyone wants to correct me. Also to note... Uh... Cynthia's comment in the chat. I don't know if that was placed anywhere, seen. A question on domestic violence, correct? I, think, I believe, yeah. Uh, when we're talking about other things that uh, should perhaps be written about, I think was the context in which that comment was written. Oh yeah, I, I'm writing about that. Okay. That's all I need. <laughs> Thank you all. This is the last chance for anyone else to bring up something that they need or want or desire or want to share as a happy thought. Uh, my, my, I guess, political statement is let's ask big. Let's see some real transformative changes here in the city of Northampton. If anything, if any uh, municipality is poised to do so, it is us. And we should uh, take that with great pride. Thank you, Josie. Thank you, Josie. I'll sleep better with that in my heart. <laughs> um, per I'd like to entertain personal note, I got vaccine today. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> Greenfield. I have to I have to say I felt like an honored guest in that setting. They do it was the, the health department in Greenfield. They are so, firefighters and nurses and volunteers. They greeted me like I was an honored guest. It was very personal, very wonderful. And in contrast with an experience we had had uh, down in uh, Eastfield Mall, where we felt like we were cattle going into the slaughter. <laughs> so, so my wife is also in love with the fireman who gave her her. Um, <laughs> so good. I'm gonna 
I'm going to entertain a um, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I second the motion. Awesome. Uh, my mom, here's my list. Booker. Yes. Carol. Yes. Javier. Yes. Alex. Yes. Dan. Yes. Michael. Yes. Josie. Yes. And that's it, right? Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you for all of our guests. Um, I again apologize that we couldn't entertain public comment from those of you who wanted to comment after the public comment session was over. I hope you will be there on Saturday so you can join in and, and give us your comments at that time. Bye-bye. Take Bye. it easy, Night, everyone. Thanks. Be safe.